Hi everyone, I'm Mary, and today we're going to look at Tech Talks history, specifically early aviation, aces, conmen, and engineers. This is about Dr. Christmas, the 20th century conman who, or is it 19th century? Previous century comment? Let's go with that. Who basically could tell a good yard and get people to give him money, who really shouldn't give him money, or planes, or apparently protected national assets, like at the time, rare engines for planes i'm still stuck on that ah <sighs> so it's going to get worse i've been told it's going to get worse and i also kind of figured considering if it didn't get worse text probably wouldn't cover it so let's just go find out how it gets worse you guys know the deal link below original video hit it up let's get started death of a mailman chapter six i'm still doing the 20th announcer voice I must say that finding a willing person to get into an untested non-proven design let alone an obvious death trap of an aircraft was a lot easier back in the teens. Life expectancy. I mean, I know the thing is you're going to be saying, yeah, it sounds like it should be a lot easier because it's life expectancy. But we all know if someone said, I got an untested aircraft, that's almost guaranteed to kill you, but it can go really damn fast. There's going to be an entire line of people doing it. Hell, I think that's still a thing now that they do on the salt flats in Utah. So, yeah. He was far lower for a variety of reasons. Cigarettes Dr. Christmas being one of them considered healthy to an extent. The first oh, I forgot that was actually a Europe thing. Yeah, they did think cigarettes had health benefits. Would soon be a sport. Needless to say, it was an adventurous time for those who learned war to was turn a off the fear. sport early on, yeah. So when Cuthbert Mills, former army aviator turned pilot for the US mail service, average was mail pilot to fly the bullet, he was actually proud. But? He still wanted to fly the world-changing aircraft even after seeing it in person. So I am going to say that Cuthbert Mills was a very brave man. He was so proud of his... Huh. Okay. Apparently we have seen where the various Charger pilots from Battletech come from as a basis. These crazy bastards. Selection as test pilot that he invited his mother to watch him take the bullet on its first test flight. And she did because she... I just realized it's called the bullet. He's been saying this the entire time. I was like, the bullet, the bullet, the bullet. And I just realized what that means. He's literally inviting his mom to watch him take a bullet. Do I even need to say anything about irony at this point? Do I even need to say anything? This is, oh my God. I, how does that conversation go? Mother dearest, would you come and watch me take a bullet, please? It would be most beneficial to my state of mind if you could watch me take said bullet to the brain pan. And still, that would have a better chance of survival than what I'm assuming has here. She was proud of her boy. As records indicate, the Christmas bullet's maiden flight was January 1919. And a few hundred feet into the air, the wings peeled right off the aircraft. As such, test pilot Cuthbert Mills bought the farm that day. And to Dr. Oh, Christmas's that's credit, a phrase for he would dying. indeed be famous. But not for anything he actually did. To celebrate this obviously massive success, they celebrate. Dr. Christmas placed an ad in Flying Magazine claiming that the Christmas bullet had achieved a 197 mile an hour top speed demonstrated at Central Park in Long Island. Oh, don't tell me. Don't tell me he's including the terminal velocity as a successful test. I hear things go great when there's nothing keeping them up and they're falling from 100 plus feet in the air. That's a really fast way to pick up speed. Mm. <laughs> Which I suppose it technically achieved, but only briefly, and in the direction of down. Yeah. The destruction of the army engine was never revealed to the government, and its loss was never investigated. Mill's death was suppressed through the efforts of Dr. Christmas, even though this happened in New York, which was a densely populated part of the world even back then. Such a part too. Cuthbert Mills became a non-event, and friends, I'll say this: it gets stranger still. Aviation journalist J.D. Van Villey claimed that the aircraft had successfully completed five test flights, and that the pilot Mills had landed safely, and praised the bullet's handling and capabilities. Mills was now famous in print as a test pilot, according to an aviation journalist. 
the very same journalist would praise the bullet well until the 1930s. I'm assuming he also became very wealthy for no inexplicable reason at all that no one ever looked into because it was completely normal. Claiming later in popular aviation that the Christmas bullet as flown in 1919 was the world's first cantilever monoplane, which considering that the Junkers the world's Let's first be honest, what did that just say there? Very personal autograph photo. Obviously not a conflict of interest. Oh, that's writing. I thought that was a smudge at first. Huh. Her monoplane, which, considering that the Junkers J1, the actual first cantilever monoplane, Junkers, flew J1. quite well three oh, years before the bullet bit it, is a bit strange as a statement to be made by an aviation journalist in print, which suggests that the journalist was either completely bullshitting the industry for unknown reasons, or that Dr. Christmas's effect again demonstrates the improbable capability of mesmerizing aviation experts and industry leaders, regardless of distance. Honestly, this might not even be Christmas doing it. For all we know, it could be one of the people who realized they fucked up, who invested in something that they fucked up, and is doing everything they can to hide the fact that they fucked up. And maybe him as well. I don't know. It could go either way. At this point, covering your ass is almost a necessity, and the fact that if he suddenly starts looking bad when everyone else really pulled for him, that's a lot of face you can lose back at a time when losing face mattered. For a time. Dr. Christmas, though, had in fact kept Mill's death fairly quiet, regardless of his famous appearance in journals post mortem. It is unfortunate to note that aviation incidents were a fair bit more common back in 1919. However, media and advertising had been organized to paint over the loss of a pilot while praising the design. So this wasn't even unusual. This was the standard practice of ignoring the fact that the design fucking sucked. Oh, that's not even surprising. The truth of Mill's death and the details of many further events surrounding Hire this business company yeah. survive only thanks to Vincent Bernelli, who had documented everything during design and had then stayed in touch afterward with friends at CAC, deeply worried about the people now trapped in Dr. Christmas's flying circus. Bernelli's account asserts that many pilots were approached to fly the bullet, who then refused to fly the plane once they saw it up close. Good! And that Mills was merely the first to say yes. Bernelli had thought at the time that this death and destruction would be the end of the Christmas bullet as a project. By comparison, the Dayton Wright RB1 racer was a strutless design that didn't kill its pilot. You know, that shouldn't be the high bar, but at least here apparently it is. And likely Dr. Christmas's aviation ambitions as a concept, Bernelli perhaps hoped that Dr. Christmas would crash and burn, leaving the world a safer place. No, no, Tex, why, why did you have to phrase it like that? Why do you have to phrase it like that? That just guarantees he's going to get worse. I mean, I knew it, but I was kind of holding out hope and ah. However... Bernelli's account foreshadows what follows with, but I underestimated the doc. The safety factor. The loss of the first bullet and catastrophically, its engine was threatening the aviation greatness of Dr. Christmas. Regardless of what was printed for the public, the backers and people at Continental Aircraft knew that the first bullet was very suddenly gone, as was its test pilot. Shocking! Dr. Christmas needed a miracle to stay in business. So through his connections, he convinced the army to loan him a propeller for a second bullet without ever bothering to tell them that the first had exploded. Did it explode or did it literally just kind of crumple into P actually considering how overbuilt things were, it might've actually exploded before it crumpled. Yeah. Also, he couldn't even make a propeller. He had to actually get one from the army because he couldn't actually make a propeller. He didn't have the factory capacity or the people who were left competent enough that didn't quit to make a propeller. I can understand a lot of that, but propellers weren't the craziest design choice at the time. Like, was it supposed to be super efficient for something that's going to just blow up? Oh, I don't you just... Mm. And then with a privately acquired Hull Scott L6 engine... Continental Aircraft completed the second airframe. Oh, no. Not content to give us a single bullet, 
Dr. Christmas doubled down Two death traps. and at other people's expense and influence, he produced another in the near same fashion, which was then paraded, but not flown for public spectacle. Yeah, when a contemporary that. technical description with photographs and drawings appeared in Flight Magazine's 13th February 1919 edition, the question of aircraft safety was raised by the periodicals aviation experts. Finally, so someone! Dr. Christmas claimed a safety factor of seven throughout. Out of a hundred? Because that would actually make sense and still probably be too high. Perhaps you did not hear what I said, but this is the part where I let you feel the full power of the Dr. Christmas no. effect. So I repeat. No. When asked about the obvious safety problems with his design, Dr. Christmas responded that his design had a safety factor of seven. I need you to hear what I'm saying, so I'll say it once more. I'd be fucking kidding me. So when asked real questions, he did the entire statistics are made up 98% of the time, 20% of the time joke in reality. And people bought it. Seven. Seven is a meaningless lumber on its own unless you have something to compare it against and show how you got those entire points out. Just saying a number is like 9% of people is already more information. Percent is going to give you too much information by what he did. That's like saying out of 10 people. See, even that's too much. It's out of 10 there. I cannot fathom in my own way how to make numbers so useless. And I'm an English major. That's my entire shtick. And he's out uselessing me in just drivel. <sighs> I, I am fine. This absolutely, it just, just, Frustrating. It's over a hundred years ago, and I'm still pissed. Like an unmade bed about to fall apart. Doctor Christmas seven. told them it contains seven safety. Of seven safety for those of you who don't means know, nothing. Is a number right about here on the scale of imaginary and whimsical bullshit. And yet the aviation world glossed over and accepted it. The second bullet. And I know Textari mentioned the reason they did that is because he established safety wasn't really a thing they expected or survivability of pilots. So it's not a big deal. I mean, so a few of them die. They're just pilots. The people designing can know exactly what they're doing. And also the people who just paid our salary because, I mean, well, he has to come from somewhere and they're definitely paying well because this is a high tech industry right now. Oh, God, that doesn't sound familiar at all. Everything about this is pissing me off, and I hate it. Why the hell did text make something that I'm enjoying being pissed off about? Damn and thank you, text, in that exact order. And I said thank you, text, and I said thank you, text, and separate, you know what I mean. <sighs> Was also taken to, but not flown or demonstrated at the New York Air Show that year as a static display. Where again, Dr. Christmas it's a nice it toy. To easiest, never just plane to fly. Take out the engine, it's probably no, safer that way. World, which, for a plane that had killed one out of one of its pilots and one out of one of its flights. On the other hand, it's a great plane a for the war. Give it to the Germans, it'll definitely However, help the Allies. In this wild era, there is a limit to the amount of madness you can tolerate. You sure? Which Dr. Christmas frequently pushed. He began to claim that Britain and France, on his word alone, with no proof whatsoever, had expressed interest in sizable purchases of his aircraft. The worst part was that wouldn't even be that hard to bullshit because while I'm going to say some of the people with means should have been able to find court filings against the guy they bought from within the same country, intercontinental news was more things you went to the cinema for because apparently that's a thing you did back then. That's a thing. And it was very much the shape of yellow journalism where they would very much give you exactly what the people at the time thought was exactly what they wanted to hear. Uh, no, actually, never mind. It sounds exactly the same. More importantly, <sighs> for all we know, he had one person who had French ancestry, 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 I can't speak today, ancestry, there's the word. And they said, hmm, 
maybe I should talk to people at home about this. And that's all he needs to run with it. I don't believe he did that because that would be way too legitimate for this guy. I'm giving him the benefit of the very little amount of doubt. Very little amount. He, he has great trust to fuck it up, in my opinion. Due to the Christmas bullets demonstrated benefits. For the what enemy. demonstrated benefits and versus what aircraft it's a handicap. I cannot say. But Dr. Christmas certainly knew and sold his ideas all the same without any proof. Unironically, if they really wanted to make this a massive seller, the Kaiser during World War I should have done everything in his power to finance this guy and to make him the mainstay for the entire Allied forces. Or, well, I guess they weren't the Allied forces at the time. That's more World War II. But uh, that is just... That's promoting such a stupid idea that it actually makes your life easier. But these are not even the boldest claims what? in this era of Dr. Christmas's life. Oh, no. For instance, immediately after the Great War, Dr. Christmas claimed Germany had offered him $1 million in gold to rebuild the entire aviation industry. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, that that is... Sorry, the reason I'm finding this so funny is the biggest reason for World War II is because Germany was stripped of wealth massively to the point where everyone was pissed and it led rise to the Hitler because he could easily say, see, it's their fault. And people listened to him and they just piled on everything after that. The fact that his claim is literally completely impossible that they could have that much gold waiting around for this freaking idiot should be more unbelievable, but um, honestly, he's done some crazy ass shit already and got actual government backing, so maybe it isn't in hindsight. That's actually depressing. Regardless of the international restrictions placed on post-war Germany and aircraft production, or having the money to do it, claimed at multiple points thereafter to have invented the aileron. But regardless of what he'd said or was printed, the facts did. remained. One plane had crashed. Wait, did he actually invent it? To have in aircraft production. He also claimed at multiple points thereafter to have invented the oh, aileron. Oh, claim, so he didn't actually do it good. I hate to give him credit for anything. Or was printed, the facts remained. One plane had crashed, and the other was a prop living on borrowed time. And still and better than the first one because it wasn't killing its pilot. would have stopped there and folded perhaps oh, no. just like the wings of the Christmas bird. No, 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 what did he do but next? But Dr. Christmas was not one to back down from destiny even if that destiny was entirely self-appointed. And so, in defiance of good reason, on 27th April 1919, in Nassau County, New York, the second bullet took to the air. At the controls was decorated World War I pilot, an American volunteer, Ellington Joyce Jolly. <sighs> and the next victim. The French prior to America's entry into the war. He'd been decorated by the French God. government and earned the rank of captain in the French Air Force during the conflict. He was a capable aviator, currently serving as a lieutenant in the post-war United States Army Air Service with serious flight time spent in difficult circumstances. And four months after the first bullet crashed, the second similarly shed its wings and went into a barn at speed, killing the pilot on impact. With the headline Christmas Killing Jolly being fairly negative even back then, Huh. 1919. Oh, this is before the 20s even still. Huh. An experimental aircraft flown by Lieutenant Allington Joyce Jolly broke up in flight at a private airfield in Long Island. He tragically perished on impact. Okay, I thought he said survive and then died. That would be even worse. Ooh. At least they're talking about it now. How did he hide it? Then, the good Dr. Christmas decided to get ahead of any naysayers by printing his own take on events, well, which yeah. are truly very interesting a may 1919 issue of vanity fair has dr christmas touting the bullets flawless safety record no mention of either test i mean it has a 100 percent record everything i just said is unfortunately true if you figured out what i meant pilot dying appears just the plane and of course it's repeated claims to exceptional performance Nobody really bothered Perfect to kill count. terribly deep as Continental Aircraft was a small 1.0 KD even. And thus a non-competitor to anyone who'd want to expose their gross incompetence and shameful negligence and allowing someone like Dr. Christmas anywhere near aircraft design. Or just in a God. sane world, Dr. Christmas would have had his day in court over something like this. And it sounds like he already did and he got away with that shit. 
he concealed the destruction of government property, destroyed government property, killed two pilots, and exercised new- One of which was currently a reservist, so that's military personnel on top of that, granted. For which there's a long history of that never mattering anywhere except for propagation, but whatever. Propaganda? That's the word. Numerous counts of fraud and reckless negligence, depending on the prosecutorial point of view. Granted, this is still before Tampany Hall and all that other teapot drum stuff came up, so I'm pretty sure this is in the, yeah, it still makes everything now look slightly less corrupt phase. However, the end of 1918 and the first few months of 1919 brought change. Coincidentally, around the same time, the government largely stopped caring about their missing property, as it now had new problems, like how to get everyone home as safely and cheaply as possible as the war had ended. The peace conference would continue what the war began, and as such- Okay, so he made claims after the war? Was this during the peace conference? No, 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 he was talking about after this point, so we're jumping around a little in time. Okay. Everything no longer required for a peacetime army was, well, deemed to be surplus. As the issuing of the Liberty Six engine came so close to the end of the conflict, its uninvestigated disappearance is likely a That's result a lot of, of being lost in the chaos of Allied forces now rotating home, if not the rapid stand down of government procurement services post-war. I will say at this juncture, any sane man would have kept quiet about this sort of thing. Oh no. But this was Dr. William Whitney isn't. Christmas. And so the good doctor went to the House Select Committee on Expenditures of the War Department. But why tell you about it? Why? I can show you. Because, thankfully, we have the entire transcript. Oh! Please enjoy the following selection. Oh no, these are the actual recreation words. by the Black Pants Legion. All rise. <laughs> Please be seated. This is a House Subcommittee number one on Aviation for Select Committee on Expenditures in the War Department, August 5th in the year of our Lord, 1919. McGee and Christmas. Walter W. Oh McGee presiding, New York, 35th District. First testimony is William Whiting uh, Christmas. Note, the government transcript gives his name as Dr. William Whiting Christmas, not Whitney, as other records match. Given his activities up to this point, I understand if his middle name is inaccurate or a fabrication. I'm assuming it's this guy. I don't even expect Christmas to be his real name. He just fabricated a really good story prior to med school or that he graduated. I fully expect to find out sometime he got everything faked because this is the kind of con artist this asshole is. He is sworn in by Congressman McGee and then the show begins. Oh, that's so, what Dr. Christmas, uh, where do you reside? I am residing at the present uh, time in New York City. Hmm. And how long have you resided there? Uh, well, about three years. Hmm. Uh, may I ask your present age? Uh, 52. Only? Huh. Hmm. Uh, where did you reside prior to that time? In Washington City. Ah, how long did you reside there? Washington about City? Oh, D.C. Years. Uh, and where Is it somewhere are you? else? In hmm. North Carolina. Hmm. Uh, and is that your native state? Yes, sir. Hmm. All right, uh, so where were you educated? I was educated at the public schools of Washington and at the uh, University of Virginia and George Washington University. Huh, you graduated from the University of Virginia? Yes. Oh, all right, excellent. In what class? Uh, in the class of 1885, I think. Did he? So what is your present occupation in the... I know text over, but... I am the president of the Cantilever... Why is he playing that music in the background? And it's slowly building, but it's a waltz. And waltz is usually bit. Oh, something's going to go stupid, isn't it? Aero Company. Huh. And is that a corporation? Yes, sir. That is a corporation. Huh. Uh, when was it created? When? Uh, yes. When was it organized? Uh, about a year ago. My profession is that of a scientist, pure and simple. Yes, he studies how stupid he is people can be. something of a scientist. Yes, he says that to the committee. Yes, it's on the record. 
and painfully. It's the last semi-accurate thing he says in this entire testimony. Oh, no. No, no, Tex, don't say that. That just makes it sound so much worse. Don't, no. Oh, God, it's gonna, I don't even, ah! Uh, okay, yeah, I'm cutting this one here because there's only so much Christmas I can take, and right now I'm in a very bah humbug mood, so we're just gonna cut this there and go get some milk and cookies to distract myself because, frankly, fuck this guy! You know what? No. Blue ball this guy and then throw him outside in the cold. Just go Scrooge himself. Ugh. Everything about this annoys me. I know I've said it's over 100 years ago, and it still annoys me because it's just so much stupid. Apparently, we found my rage button. Incredibly stupid people getting conned by incredibly stupid people. I, I, I don't even realize how could this enrage me so much, but it is, and I am very pissed. Oh, I swear, if Tex wasn't such a good narrator getting this information out, I would not actually care nearly as much. But he is, and it's worse because of it! But also more entertaining at the same time, which is a really weird dichotomy. I'm not sure how to wrap my head around! Ah! I thought I would finish this today. I really did. And honestly, I have the time for once. Right now, I'm stopping because if I don't, I am going to punch my screen out of frustration. And I honestly don't have the mind to afford that because that would be really annoying. And honestly, I don't want to explain to my wife why I need to go to the hospital, bandage my hand, and also replace a screen at the same time. Again, not, not doing that again. More importantly, you guys know the deal. There's a link below to the original video, and I'm going to go de-stress and... Maybe you get a print out of this guy's face and maybe punch it a few times. It won't be nearly as sad as one because I don't have a punching bag. And also, I'm very weak, so if I had a punching bag, I'd probably break my hand because that would be very embarrassing. Yeah, don't want to do that again either. So yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. Adios.